you will find little joy in your command, but with luck, you will find the strength to do what needs to be done. Kill the boy, John Snow. Kill the boy and let the man be born. John comes to Eamon feeling conflicted about what he knows he needs to do because it's going to make him very unpopular. And Eamon's telling him a really important thing, which is you have to trust yourself, and when you've determined that something is the right course of action, then do it. And even if all your advisors tell you otherwise, you trust your intuition on this. And John does, and it's a very dangerous thing that he's doing because the wildlings are the traditional enemies of the Night's Watch. And these people have been killing each other for thousands of years, and John is essentially trying to not only make peace with them, but trying to save their lives and risk the lives of many Night's Watch men in order to save them. So that's going to be a very unpopular decision amongst the majority of the Night's Watch. Reek! You will give away the bride. Someone has to. What better person? Waldo and I have some good news as well. We're going to have a baby. From the way she's carrying, Mr. Walken says it looks like a boy. Ramsey sees a way to throw Sansa off balance the way he does. In that dinner table scene, it gets turned on him at the very end of the scene where Roos gets tired of how much fun Ramsey is having and makes him a little bit less confident in his position by talking about his potential replacement as an heir. Roos sees Ramsey becoming increasingly cocky now that he's been legitimized and named as the heir apparent, and he doesn't necessarily want him to be quite so sure of his position. He believes that Ramsey's a little bit better actually when he's a little insecure and when he's when he feels like he needs to prove himself. And so, you know, on the one hand, kind of knocking Ramsey down a peg and saying, I'm still the boss here, so remember that. And for another thing, giving Ramsey that much more incentive to really prove himself and to show why he deserves to be the future Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. I fly upon a wall, the waves, the sea wind, whipped and churned. A city of a thousand years, and all that men had learned. The doom consumed it all alike, and neither of them turned. I would clap. It's a bit of shared history that they both have, you know, as much as they've been at each other's throats, they do have some similarities. They're in a strange land, they're in a place where no one ever goes anymore. People avoid Valyria for a reason, and now you've got these two men from noble families in Westeros who are a long way from home, going through one of the most terrifying places in the world, at least according to superstition. So it's kind of a, a strange bonding moment for them. It's almost like the first time you've seen them having a bit of affection for each other. They start to see some of the similarities and some of the commonalities that they share as people. And that in a different situation, under different circumstances, they probably would have been friends. Seeing Drogon in the scene is a very powerful moment for both Jorah and Tyrion for different reasons. I think for Jorah, it's this visible, visceral reminder of the woman he loves and is devoted to and who is doing anything and everything possible to get back to. And Drogon is so much bigger than he was the last time he saw him that it's, it's almost like Danny looming even larger in, in his mind than she did when she was right in front of him. For Tyrion, it's a completely arresting moment for him. And it's kind of a, an uplifting moment for him because they've just been talking about what's it all for and it all turns into ruins and then all of a sudden something living and breathing from the past explodes into his world and it's almost like a like a, a beacon of hope for him that maybe these ruins aren't all the remains maybe there is something of this greatness that's left in the world 